Okay, good morning, everyone. It is uh, interesting to be uh, here and to have this session of uh, the questions of the AC of the IGM Quito. And thank you for your presence and looking forward to the conversation that we will today. Session Transforming Technology and Works for the Planet um, is a competitive conversation of importance of technologies, the role of governance, and the change in it to uh, tech companies held accountable for nations, both models, human rights, air justice, and sustainable development. In that sense, this session is to read of uh, changes needed to extend the stand governance to transform the technology in the planet. In 2022, and I, I would like to welcome uh, our speakers and thank them uh, for being here and for sharing your perspectives and your work. So we have Ken Kemli Camacho from Slavatsu. Costa Rica. We have Yilma Akuyun, um, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Senior Policy Officer at the Federacy for Economic Cooperation and Development, GMZ, the Digital Technologies Unit in Berlin, Germany. Uh, Becky Kasansky, Independent Researcher. We have Florena Roveri joining from um, Argentina. She's from a civil society organization called Notau. And Jaime Villal also joining us remotely from Mexico, from May 1st. Um, so welcome all of you and thank you so much for being here. We're Shona Finnegan from APC joining from Canada and she's the wrap of the role. Uh, we'll also obviously welcome your interventions from the floor. Um, mm, so we expect to have this conversation with you as well. Uh, so let me start with uh, with Kemli, um, with learning from the experience of the Cooperativa Sulabatsu in Costa Rica. So Kemli, why is it important that we are having this conversation about transforming technology frameworks uh, at the IGF, and what can we learn from the experiences of the Sulabatsu Cooperative? So please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for being here online and uh, here in the room. Um, <coughs> we we are uh, Sulabatsu, um, self-managed cooperative, uh, 20 years, working in alternatives uh, for digital economy, um, and uh, we are looking for uh, promote uh, non-extractivist digital economy. Uh, um, exploring in ourselves for these 20 years, but also incubating uh, two initiatives about entrepreneurship, non-extractive entrepreneurship for the digital economy. Uh, if we have to describe the, um, the current uh, development uh, model that we are using, and especially the digital economy, I think the world has to be extractivist. And not only extractivist uh, because of the extractivism of natural resources, which is enough, but also uh, is a extractivist model of solidarity, of time for organization, of time for reflection, of time for citizenship participation. We describe that extractivism as the base of the model of the digital economy. And then we, we think we have to create alternatives, we have to create resistance to this model. The motto of this uh, digital economy is a business model uh, who promote constant innovation based in extreme consumption, especially digital commodities. Um, we, we ask uh, APC to convene uh, this, um, this workshop to really together reflect, propose, share challenges and success building other business model for a non-extractivist digital economy. We have done that uh, 20 years at Sulabat Zoom, exploring this alternative based in a combination of social economy and feminist uh, models and feminist economy uh, proposals. Not only for our own business, uh, but also, as I said before, um, to create incubators for entrepreneurship, especially for women in IT, the, to develop other 
other kind of business models. Uh, we have learned how to integrate solidarity, friendship, happiness, passion in business models. And we have created business models where these words and where these beliefs are part of the business model, part of the accounting, part of the project management, part of uh, the, the team collective, yes? Uh, and uh, we have learned how to develop non-profit business as a strategy to respond to social, economic, and uh, cultural problems. For the social economy model in the inside the digital economy, uh, the business part is an answer for the social, uh, cultural, and economical needs. It's not the main issue, do the, the business part. Yes, this, that comes from the social economy perspective. Yes, non-profit business models where the business is the answer to these social problems. Inside the IT society who have a specific uh, problems related with the digital. Um, we also uh, have learned how to put care in the center of our business model. And that's, that comes from the feminist economy. Care in the center of business models. Then solidarity in the center of business model. Care in the center of business model. Non-profit models. Yes, in the digital, for a digital, non-extractive digital society. Um, there are important challenges we have launched our platform co-op incubators year, last year in alliance with the National Center for Training in Co-ops and in alliance with the University of Mondragon. And we have uh, incubated uh, since uh, 10 years already digital feminist initiatives based in a model that we have created who began with a feminist hackathon, which, which is very different than a normal hackathon. Yes, it's a hackathon not for, for compet competition, but for sharing, yes, and everything. Uh, I not, cannot go in details, but we have created this incubator of digital feminist initiatives. Um, but of course, we confront in our context uh, difficulties in the innovation ecosystem to try to support these initiatives, platform co-ops or feminist, uh, in, uh, feminist entrepreneurship for the IT and for the digital society because they, they not fit in what they understand is an innovation or, or in what they understand is a business model for the digital economy. Then the access to finance, to support, to technical support uh, is very hard and difficult. We have to create them ourselves also. Then this is a main challenge. We really believe there is a need to create alternatives and demonstrate there are other ways to develop the digital economy, and we feel it's urgent. Planet is burning, and the answer is not in the business model that we have created until now. We have to create other business model and demonstrate that it's possible to develop a digital economy not based in extractivism. There are movements in advance of ourselves where we can look at ex the examples. And always I put the um, organic agriculture as an example of how we can develop these other models. And also, of course, the social economy. They, have inspir uh, they inspire our experience, and we hope we inspire you to propose alternatives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken Lee particularly for reminding us that uh, 
Uh, there can, there, it is possible to have a digital economy that contributes to planetary justice, environmental justice, not uh, dissociated from care and solidarity. So I think that's very important and that's the change of paradigm. So um, uh, with that, um, I could like to invite one of our remote uh, speakers, Florencia Roveri from Nodo Tau, who is joining us from Argentina. So. Um, Florencia, can you hear us? Can you confirm if you can hear us? Yes, hello, good night. Yeah, we can Form hear you us. perfectly. <laughs> welcome, so nice to see you. Florencia, How welcome to the panel. And uh, uh, I could like you to please, uh, Florencia, tell us what motivated Nodo Tau to transform your e-waste management facility into a cooperative. And what has been the impact so far also, we are very curious to hear about the obstacles that you have faced in that transitioning process. So uh, you have the floor and welcome again, Florencia. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you for the invitation to share our experience in this. Can you hear me? Yes, Florencia, yes, we can okay. hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, for sharing our experience in this in this instance in this pre event, it is um, very valuable for us to participate and and add our view. Um, we are a social organization in Argentina, and as Valeria mentioned, we 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 turn from um, uh, we are a social organization that work for the digital inclusion of uh, organizations. Um, in created, uh, uh, sorry, uh, created by a group of engineers, educators, and social activists, and um, we move from this uh, objective of um, working for the access to technology to lead with the excess of technology. In that, in that sense, we develop a plant for the treatment of e-waste. Um, we began uh, in in. Uh, sorry for uh, I I have uh, I, I I am going to start again. Sorry. Um, Nodo Tau is a social organization created in 1995, and uh, we develop our work um, in that sense. The plant we we create it, it has to do with the excess of machines we start to receive from companies uh, machines that we. Uh, delivered for uh, the, the organization of a, a, a network of telecenters. Um, the plant was created in uh, 2019, and it, it was in the frame of a, of a, of a local program of work inclusion. Um, um, And it was formed by six young men and uh, one woman, accompanied by uh, three members of Nodo Tau. The, the plant receives uh, mainly um, e-waste from companies and public bodies um, that must... Uh, sorry, 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 Valeria, I, I'm, uh, I'm dealing with my nervous <laughs> and the distance. I have, I have a... Um, I have to to reorganize. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay, Florencia. If you prefer, we can come back to you in a, in a bit. Uh, is that something that you could like us to do? Then we can uh, invite him, and then we can go back to you. Is it okay? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, oh, but if we you prefer to continue, yes, yes. if you prefer to continue yes, yes, now, so. or it's also okay. So just let me know what okay. your preference would be. Mm -hmm. We create the plant uh, in that frame I, I, I was mentioning, and after four years after the creation of the plant, we start uh, leading with some aspects related to the, um, the focus of Nodo Tau as uh, in the work of uh, digital inclusion, but also in the sustainability of the plant. Uh, so we we need to face that challenge of articulating the dynamic of the um, of the organization and of the plant management. Our focus uh, was 
a more general work and the the the, the uh, cooperative uh, was uh, growing um, we create it, it has to do with the excess of machines we start to receive from companies uh, machines that we uh, delivered for uh, the, the organization of a, a, a network of telecenters um, the plant was created in uh, 2019 and it, it was in the frame of a, of a local program of work inclusion um, um, and it was formed by six young men and uh, one woman, accompanied by uh, three members of Nodoptau. The, the plant receives uh, mainly um, e-waste from companies and public bodies um, that must... Uh, sorry, 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 Valeria, I, I'm, uh, I'm dealing with my nervous <laughs> and the distance. I, ha I have a... Um, I have to, to reorganize. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay, Florencia. If you prefer, we can come back to you in a, in a bit. Uh, is that something that you could like us to do? Then we can uh, invite Jaime, and then we can go back to you. Is it okay? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, oh, but if we you prefer to continue, yes, yes. if you prefer to continue yes, yes, now, so. all, it's also okay. So just let me know what your okay. preference would be. Mm -hmm. We create the plant uh, in that frame I, I, I was mentioning, and after four years after the creation of the plant, we start uh, leading with some aspects related to the, um, the focus of Nodotau as uh, in the work of uh, digital inclusion, but also in the sustainability of the plant. Uh, so we, we need to face that challenge of articulating the dynamic of the, um, of the organization and of the plant management. Our focus uh, was a more general work and the, 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 the uh, cooperative uh, was uh, growing. Um, sorry, go on with, with Jaime, sorry for that, sorry for that. Thank you so much, uh, Florencia, for um, sharing your experience. And then you can add anything when we are in part of the conversation. Feel free to jump in and add, and add anything that you might want to, to share with the, o with the audience. Um, um, now let's turn to Mexico and to invite reflections by, uh, from Jaime Villarreal from the May 1st uh, Movement Technology Cooperative. Jaime, um, it could be uh, very useful for us to hear your, sper your perspective on why it is important for May 1st Movement Technology to be a democratically run, not-for-profit cooperative. Please uh, do share your experience with us. You have the mic. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, so, so when May 1st members join our cooperative, they're choosing to join an organization that supports building movements for social and environmental justice, right? And, and our specific focus in, in within that is the role of technology in, in, in both local and international movement struggles. And so in addition to the, the movement outreach and engagement uh, that we do, one of May 1st central projects is maintaining our own autonomous communications infrastructure. And what that means is we run our, our own servers, our own internet servers. We provide email and, and web hosting and file sharing and, and other communication services like uh, video conferencing for our members. And, and as part of our cooperative, that means our members of the cooperative collectively own and we democratically govern together this infrastructure. And, and what that gives our members the power to do is that year after year, they consistently vote to maintain this project, to keep our own infrastructure, and to keep that infrastructure free of any kind of surveillance or exploitation. And this is really, really important. It, a lot of times people ask us, so, so are you creating a, an alternative to the corporate internet services? And, and I like to say that, no, we're, we're not an alternative to, to Google or to Meta or Amazon or those, because we are focusing on the needs of our members. 
uh, we are providing the tools that facilitate communication that allow them to organize and take action to create a better world a, a, on their own terms. And, and contrary to popular belief, this is not something that corporate internet monopolies are in the business of, of doing. They are not facilitating communication. Their core business is data collection and data mining. Any communication services they provide are, are just hooks, are, these caref are carefully engineered to coerce consumers into giving up their privacy. Uh, these business models are fundamentally extractive and exploitive. So because these companies collect and store petabytes of data, uh, personal data from, from citizens and from, uh, and from consumers, the, the necessary computing resources and the environmental impact of running their operations is astronomically larger than, than our own. So in terms of environmental sustainability, we are already at an advantage simply because we do the right thing and we don't engage in this kind of surveillance and data collection. But aside from that obvious benefit uh, of being free of surveillance, our members are still interested in us finding new ways to increase our environmental sustainability and to reduce our carbon footprint. Unfortunately, for an organization of our size, uh, our options are, are limited. Uh, where we can place our servers is limited by uh, both human resources and by access to, to high-speed broadband. And we, as, as a small organization, simply don't have the capital to build uh, our own data centers that would be closer or have direct access to renewable energy resources. And also finding cost-effective solutions to processing our own e-waste is also a challenge. And so that's something we're interested in learning from, from other APC members about, like Nolo Tao. So this is this is one of the this is the advantage I think that comes from uh, allowing our members to guide uh, our own project and being a cooperative model that gives our members uh, a voice and a vote and control and ownership over their own communications. That's a very powerful experience to share. Thank you so much, uh, Jaime, and also because it uh, illustrates the interplay between environmental sustainability and the, rein the, the reinforcement of the exercise of rights online and offline. So that's, that's quite interesting and inspiring. Uh, so governments, obviously governments could be key allies and champions for environmental justice. And in that sense, we are very happy to have Yilmaz here in the panel with us to share the perspective of the German public strategy and approach on this field. So, Gilmas, uh, what does cooperation mean in the context of digitalization from the perspective of uh, BMZ? So, and welcome. Uh, um, and also, if you can also perhaps, let me just um, um, add something. So, if you can also touch upon how can global norms um, and standards relating to internet governance and environmental governance support can support these cooperative models and uh, these approaches, and in that sense, uh, work all together towards a, a fair transition, a just transition. So welcome, and uh, let us uh, hear your views. Dear Valeria, thank you so much for this interesting question. It's a great honor and pleasure to share my views on behalf of the BMZ in day zero here at the IGF and to learn more about the work of co cooperatives around the globe and take it back to Berlin to also check uh, how our work is uh, aligned with uh, what cooperatives uh, do. Um, let me start with the first question and then uh, tackle the, the second one too. So cooperation is at the heart of what BMZ does. It's in our name, BMZ stands for Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development as German BMZ. We want to enhance economic, political, and societal participation of all our people in our countries, partner countries, especially the most marginalized. This is our mission, and cooperation with our partners is essential for the holistic approach, necessary to address the root causes of the complex problems that we are facing today. These global challenges did not become easier if we consider climate change, which you just mentioned, pandemics, poverty, and the fight against hunger. They all require coordinated responses that go beyond individual projects. And now let me get to what cooperation means, especially in the field of digital affairs, digitalization. If we look how the world looks today, it's 
happening very unequally. Almost half of the pop world's population do not have access to the internet. We are here in Japan, and the access, of course, very different if we consider partners in the global south. There, women and marginalized communities are particularly affected by this digital divide. Whereas more than 90% of people are online in the European Union, or Germany, where I am from, in our partner countries, fewer than 40% do have internet access, and we are working to change this. So cooperation is key for us in addressing these issues, and I think we, be, we need conversations between countries as the from the global south and the north to make digitalization benefits all. Staying true to the claim to leave no one behind, we first need to make sure that everyone can benefit from digital transformation. What does it mean? This means prioritizing, prioritizing inclusivity and promoting meaningful equal access for all people, especially in these vulnerable and marginalized communities are essential. And yes, global norms are essential, essential in doing this. We have three cornerstones in our digital policy work to, to get there. And um, norms are one of them. Um, we could uh, talk about uh, this um, in our own panel, I, I would say. Um, but for us, um, they are essential, especially digital public goods. And um, this is um, very important for us in, in our work. And um, yesterday you had, um, I think, one conversation um, of the role of the Global Digital Compact. And um, we are very engaged in that process, in the dialogue, contributing. And I think we, we have an interesting uh, road ahead to the summit of the future in getting there and um, shaping this together and uh, learning um, from you um, is helpful for us to, to contribute in that process and um, engaging in, um, in, in these norms. And um, we aim to promote a fair, free, open, and secure internet. This is also for me part of the, the norms you, you mentioned. To get a digital transformation which is ecological, social, and feminist. And in this way, the digital transformation can be a driver of progress towards achieving the SDGs where we are now on our half time if we consider the agenda 2030. I hope uh, this answered your question for now and I'm um, looking forward to the dialogue here and thank you for inviting again. Thank you, Yilmaz. As we heard from Kemli, if we want digital economy to really contribute to uh, planetary justice, then the consideration of feminism and gender perspective is crucial. I don't think we can get that without uh, considering that aspect. And last but not least, and before um, inviting Paz to also pose some questions for you, I would like to invite Becky to share your perspective. Becky, as a researcher in the field, how do you see this conversation of transforming technology frameworks and advancing planetary justice in the governance of technology in relation to recent policy developments, such as labeling? So very curious to hear about it. Thank you very much. Okay, I think it's on now. Um, and for the last year or so, I've been collaborating with a number of different organizations and networks, um, and APC included, to um, think about the values and principles that can guide more collaborations across different so civil society movements. Um, um, to, uh, to think about technological uh, governance that can support environmental and climate justice. <coughs> and as part of that work, we've been brainstorming on, on what a theory of change can look like on this, really, in collaboration with a number of different uh, partners and collaborators. So I wanted to share a little bit um, about some of the biggest themes that have come up from this process 
because I think it um, really brings home how important the kinds of models are that the other speakers have um, really beautifully um, illustrated already. Um, and I would say that one of the most important themes that has come up is, you know, if on the one side it's essential to support alternative models uh, for technology uh, through collaboratives, co-ops, and other models. On the other hand, it's essential that we, and I mean we in this uh, as, as a group of multi, you know, different kinds of stakeholders coming together today, um, uh, that we don't get distracted by technologies and tools uh, that on the surface can seem quite promising for uh, uh, mitigating or adapting to climate change, but which have already proven to be uh, quite harmful uh, to different kinds of communities um, and populations and countries around the world. And so uh, in, in not getting distracted, this uh, would provide more room for support for the kinds of models that are, are being discussed today. And I'll give you a few examples of the kinds of uh, distractions uh, that have come up in the policy space recently and around which there is movement uh, on the policy side um, to either reform or think strongly about uh, uh, um, restrictive uh, governance and even uh, going further than that. Um, the first is around AI, which is a subject that comes up uh, a lot <laughs> these days. Um, and I'm thinking specifically of the fact that in the uh, climate governance space, uh, the UNFCCC has recently announced a new initiative uh, to support an exploration of the promise of AI uh, as a climate technology. and. Um, on this front, um, what civil society really is arguing for is that if there is gonna be a wide scale investment, and there already is, um, into data-driven technologies like AI, then we have to make sure that their promises on the one hand aren't oversold by certain actors. And on the other hand, that um, the harms that already are apparent are actually taken account of in uh, further uh, movement movements around um, AI. And I'll give you one example in particular because AI is now being framed as an important tool in the food and water security nexus. Um, recently, there have been studies coming out that, uh, and it's, it's has been historically very difficult to measure exactly what the impact of AI has been um, on climate, water, and resources. But there have been studies showing that, for example, half a liter uh, of water is spent for every five queries that someone makes to chat GPT. So to put it into context, that's um, uh, um, a large amount of water for uh, for someone sitting in front of their computer and asking five questions to, uh, to uh, something that is powered by a very, very water and resource intensive um, uh, infrastructure. So, um, and that is just one example from the climate side, but there are so many other human rights centered harms that have been raised for uh, decades now by civil society and this really brings into question then, uh, and I think offers a lot of uh, a lot for consideration and food for thought as AI gets invested into as a climate technology. Um, and a very quick second example would be around uh, solar geoengineering. This is a, a long promise, but also very still quite speculative technology which in the last year, governments have actually announced um, an interest in investing and experimenting with on a scale that hasn't necessarily taken place before. Uh, this is a technology for which there is currently no system of governance. And in fact, uh, 400 scientists from around the world 
question whether it is even possible to govern something like solar geoengineering because it requires enormous wide-scale coordination across the world. And once it is put into place, it creates a lock-in because if it were to stop, it could make climate change and global heating much worse and much faster. So on this basis, a number of different groups are pushing for moratoriums, bans, and basically trying to invoke the precautionary principle to, uh, to make it, um, to create the space to step back and ask whether this is something that actually we citizens and uh, people living across different regions of the world um, should consent to, because once it's put in place, the impacts can be enormous. Um, and one final example from the positive side of recent uh, policy developments is around the EU Green Claims Directive, which is an innovative piece of policy which would help the consumer understand which products that they are interested in purchasing are actually living up to the many claims around sustainability that different companies make in terms of uh, net zero uh, and otherwise. Um, this is great progress. Um, uh, however, again, um, it's, um, it's clear that there is a lot to figure out and how this works in practice. And I'll give you one example, which is around carbon offsets. Um, so carbon offsets are not directly addressed, as I understand it, by the Green Claims Directive. However, it does take the perspective that a company should not be able to claim it's uh, uh, climate neutral or sustainable simply because it makes use of carbon offsets. This is an important acknowledgement and I think it responds to a number of different scientific studies, uh, consensus around that that is building and also pushback from civil society for several decades now, uh, saying that carbon offsets do not actually work ecologically the way that they are set out to and that they provide cover for companies to, to make claims that they can't necessarily deliver on. But what's really important to ask there is, is how far can this Green Claims Directive go? Um, because um, a lot of civil society is pushing for a more uh, fundamental critique of carbon offsets. They would say that it's not enough to simply say, uh, well, you can only use a certain amount of carbon offsets. They would say actually the entire carbon market system needs either reform or uh, even something more drastic than that because at the moment over 90% of carbon offsets, even the verified ones, even the ones that conform to all the standards that have been set are not working. Um, and so I'm gonna leave it there and simply say that there are a lot of questions here obviously. Um, there are positive um, governance and policy developments in this regard. Um, and the hope is that by pushing these further um, and not getting distracted by risky speculative technologies, that more support is available t for the kinds of initiatives that we've heard from today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Vicky. That's uh, also very powerful and particularly in audio, how you remind us about the need to apply the precautionary principle. I think that's a must. And hopefully it has been taken seriously by all the, all the necessary stakeholders. With that, I, I want to invite um, my co-moderator, Paz Peña, uh, first to check also if uh, you have questions for the speakers and uh, if we have also interventions from remote participants. So Paz, over to you. Thank you, Valeria. Just to remind, uh, our online participants that they can actually share their um, comments and questions on the chat or on the Q and I um, tool. I, I just want to to make a couple of you know general questions, open questions to our participants. Um, I think uh, based on what you have said, uh, the big question here is 
what is digital transformation in the context of climate and the ecological crisis, no? So as uh, Becky said, uh, in a way you have two answers, no? One is the green, um, you know, uh, um, responses that big tech is giving, uh, which by the way, are super problematic because of the extractivism na nature of big techs, not only in terms of big tech extractivism and all the infrastructure that you need for that extractivism, but also uh, because of water extractivism, natural resources in general, et cetera. No? So that is one thing that is super important to address. But in a way, I believe that governments especially are forgetting to um, actually look other business models besides the big tech model in their own uh, local companies of technologies, no? So it seems that, and, and this is something that I've been learning in all countries, for example, in Latin America, all governments try to give funds to companies to replicate the business model of big tech, no? in a way, more data, more growth, et cetera. And uh, that is why I think it's important to ask ourselves, what is digital transformation then in the context of this climate crisis? We want more data, we want more growth of that infrastructure, because that means, for example, that we need to deal with e-waste. And this is what, we, what um, the incredible um, initiative uh, that Nodotau is doing in Argentina. But who is paying for that? Is big tech paying uh, to organizations to cope with e-waste in you know, local countries as Argentina? Who's paying for that? Uh, what is doing our, you know, what what our governments doing with all that kind of um, you know, uh, e-waste that we need to deal with? when we are saying digital transformation is more big tech, et cetera, et cetera, no? Um, so uh, I think my next question, besides what is digital transformation in this context is then what is the role of governments? Not only to deal with the problem of sustainability of big techs, but also in terms of um, basically fund, fund the, um, um, alternative business models, no? Because uh, here in Latin America, we have a very historical um, tradition of different technological business models that sometimes they fail because they don't see support, no, from local governments. So what is the role of local governments in there, in, in the context of, um, of climate crisis and ecological crisis. I think those questions are key uh, in order to actually transform, radically transform uh, the planetary uh, ways to the, the, the ways that we see the planetary crisis from technology. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Paz. And uh, uh, also, um, in addition to what role uh, uh, governments have in supporting these alternative models, I would like to also add uh, how um, that support should look like concretely in practice. So uh, both our remote participants and our uh, speakers, uh, remote speakers and, and speakers on site are invited to uh, respond and to react to these questions that uh, PASS has also uh, brought up. So if any of you could like to respond, Kemli, please go. more participants okay okay um, it resonates me a lot uh, what our colleague said here about not uh, putting the emphasis in the green but in the models that we are using and that connects a lot with what Paz said uh, before because at least for Latin America you know in the imaginary of our governments, but also of our citizens, and also uh, of our academia, 
the model, the big model, yes, is startups, unicorn, big techs, yes. This business model, this way to do economy is the ideal way, is the, the road, the path where we have to go. Uh, and I think um, uh, it's crucial, yes, to really rethink these models, yes. And when I say rethink these models, is really change tools, change approaches, change methodologies to develop business models and digital economy, the same thing, yes. We have to change that. Uh, we, since after the pandemic or during the pandemic that we all in Latin America talk uh, or, or the, the solution was the digital transformation, we always said this is not the solution. The solution is digital appropriation, which is totally different for ourselves. Digital transformation is oriented to consumption. Digital appropriation is oriented to reduce consumption, to think which digital tools you really need, which digital business you really need to develop. For us, there is a main, main difference between digital transformation and digital appropriation, and we uh, go <laughs> and advocate for digital transformation. Um, uh, I have to say, when, when I talk about changing the business models, really develop tools, and I'm calling academia, I'm calling incubators, I'm calling governments to really rethink the way that we are doing business. And I'm, I'm going to put concrete examples. For instance, I don't know who, who of you have worked with the Canvas model to develop a business, yes? And this, in this Canvas model to develop a, a business, the center of the Canvas model is the value added of your business, yes? What we have done is put in the center the solid solidarity and care that your business is going to improve and develop, yes? Bef before the value added to get uh, money, yes? Uh, and also we put, instead of putting in the center of this combat model, the accumulation, we put the redistribution of the resources that you are going to make if you develop this business model. Then we have to change that, yes? Uh, because for us, this, this is in the center of the development of our society, and we cannot talk green if we are using unicorn uh, startups and big companies, us and platform companies, not co platform co op, but platform companies, as the model of the digital economy and as the model of an, our entrepreneurship in our countries. Then answering a little bit uh, the question, this is, this is my reaction. And also remember, remember to all of you, extractivism is everywhere. Because we talk about extractivism uh, for the natural resources, water, uh, all of that, and it's crucial, fundamental. But also it's extractivism of wisdom, extractivism of knowledge of the people, extractivism of solidarity, extractivism of the time. Extractivism is the center of this model. Then uh, this, is, this is my reaction, Julia. Let me invite Florencia uh, to give a space also to the virtual participation, uh, honoring the hybrid uh, format of the IGF, and then we can take reactions from the floor here. So Florencia, please, the, floors, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valeria. Just to follow uh, what you are saying, when, when we um, decide to become the plant uh, into a cooperative, um, it has to do to, to follow with the intention of providing um, a work inclusion for a group of young people adding that sense to our previous work of digital inclusion and also assuming uh, the challenge that we were facing uh, with the excess of uh, e-waste in our uh, everyday work. So we 
first develop the plant and then following the process of the plant, we decided to uh, go on with the, with the project of the co cooperative due to um, the, the aspects of the, the different focus of our work and the, the complexity of the work of the cooperative of the plant. The plant has to uh, lead with aspects related to production, to commercialization and to uh, habilitations. And it has a complexity that uh, it aims to be a, a production unit on itself. Um, we also have uh, in Nodotau an experience of accompanying another cooperative that is working in the, uh, in the treatment of cartridge tones. And they are also following this process of beca becoming a cooperative, in this case, um, 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 formed by women involved in a work of a gender organization, working with issues of uh, violence uh, and situations in, in which they are involved, in which also the, 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 the primary um, aspect is their work inclusion. So in these two experiences, we work with the treatment of technology, assuming the responsibility of dealing with that aspect of, uh, of uh, the technology, but also with a human aspect related to the work and social inclusion of these uh, groups. In the case of the plant, we also um, include another aspect that is the, the, the social destiny of the equipment that we could uh, recover and repair in the work of the plant. So these experiences invite us to rethink about the use of technology and our work with it, uh, assuming that they are still um, resources needed for the communities, but the environmental impact in, in place is, um, is needed to be assumed by, by, by a diversity of uh, actors. And one of the aspects we found uh, in the work of the cooperatives, in particular the e-waste um, cooperative management of uh, Tau, is that these responsibilities are not being perceived and, and not are not being assumed. For, and in this sense, we distinguish aspects uh, related to government responsibilities in, in the terms of developing uh, plans for integral management of e-waste and the coordination of actors and the, reg the, the, the regulation and promotion of laws. In Argentina, we do not have a national law. We have a provincial, provincial reglementation with some aspects that are interesting uh, in terms of, for example, recognizing the figure of the manager of uh, e-waste and recognizing the social reuse of equipments that is interesting in several aspects uh, that promotes the reuse uh, of uh, computers, for example, and also the responsibility of, um, of uh, companies and the private sector in which we can distinguish the responsibility of producers facilitating the disassembly process aspects with, with which we deal in the work of the plant of the management plant, and also the responsibility of compan companies that generate um, e-waste as in terms as Paz was mentioning previously. Uh, in this sense, it is important to um, visualize the cost involved in the treatment. We, we, we uh, lead locally with a lot of actors that um, want to uh, value the work of uh, the, the cooperative of Nodotau, but they assume the, that the, 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 the devices they discard are donations. In this sense, it is important to highlight a, an extended perception of this concept of the, the, the um, devices I do not use anymore or the e-waste the companies generate are donated for social use. Uh, there is a slogan in a local campaign that is don't donate your waste to me because in this sense we are um, naming donation the, the a process that is getting rid of a, a problem and give it that problem to another actor. So the idea 
is relevant dealing with any staff. This is the, that is do, don't donate waste. <laughs> but in the case of um, technology or discarded technology, the, the, there is uh, some difficulties that make it even dangerous. So that is what we want to mention. Thank you so much, Florencia. Uh, Yilmaz or Becky, would you like to take uh, some of the questions that Paz uh, brought up? Please go ahead. Um, yes, S thank you so much. Um, let me first um, start with an invitation uh, for an, uh, another session uh, of um, uh, the German uh, delegation. On Tuesday, on day two, we have a, an event, Planetary Limits of AI, Governance for Just Digitalization. This is exact um, our topic. and. Guests are welcome, and um, and I will uh, give a short overview what uh, we contribute in this field and how our approach is towards digital transformation in particular. Um, as being said, together with the European Union, we offer a human-centered digital transformation. For us, this means that we actively shape digitalization by addressing its risks for environment, in, but also in the individual human rights and society. We use the term twin transition, how digitalization can help the fight against environmental challenges. We want to actively combat social division, the misuse of data, as well as environmental and climate damage caused by resource consumption and CO2 emissions, exactly what you mentioned, and uh, I really liked your approach towards changing a business model canvas used because um, I was taking uh, MBA classes uh, in the US and uh, this was exactly what you mentioned and uh, I think um, uh, education is essential for this but uh, we'll come back to it uh, uh, later again. So as Germany we're committed towards the ecological, feminist and social digital policy and for us this enables a fair balance of interests based on European standards and universal human rights. We want to ensure that partner countries are integrated into an open, secure, and inclusive internet and fair data markets. And for that, we also need strong local governments, and I will also come back to that later. Our digital policy is based on three cornerstones, and you mentioned earlier the role of standards and norms. These are essential, but also structures. By that I mean DPI, digital public infrastructure, and goods. But third, also promoting digital skills in society and in the economy. I also really like the, the sentence about um, don't dona donate your waste to me, um, because um, I think it's also a question of education um, for, for that. But um, firstly, providing structures for human-centered digital services and public goods is vital. Many of our initiatives, to give you a more concrete examples, because otherwise sometimes um, international digital policy is very abstract, um, our initiatives contribute to more democratic and open fair societies. Our goal is to support the digital self-determination of citizens and partner countries. And this requires effective, secure infrastructure that should be based on open and reusable ICD building blocks. We have one initiative, it's uh, our flagship <laughs> initiative of the German International Digital Policy, it's called GAFSTAG. We develop a global toolbox for reusable open source building blocks for GAFTAG. And secondly, to be more concrete on the questions mentioned, we work with partner countries across the globe to promote fair regulation of the digital economy. And one initiative that I want to highlight is the so-called BMZ DTCs, the Digital Transformation Centers. They serve as a local implementation and anchor structure of these efforts. Around the globe, we already have 22, and they are our gate to the local world, to the local communities, the local governments, and <coughs> Um, further, through the initiative Fair Forward, we have worked with governments of, for example, Rwanda, Ghana, and India, and together with Smart Africa, we are involved in developing national AI strategies, and these AI national strategies have a particular focus 
on the fight against environmental challenges. I think um, we support also our global partners to realize the potential of AI through local innovation. And here's uh, where the magic, so to speak, uh, happens. Um, yeah, and um, last but not least, what you mentioned, digital skills. They are the one of the cornerstones of Beam that digital policy, training of young people in job-related digital skills, but also related to waste management and getting um, a mindset and um, a culture um, in this regard is essential. Um, therefore, we support the public sector in our daily work, the private sector, civil society, and especially young women in acquiring the necessary knowledge about digitalization and those being able to respond to the challenges of digital transformation and um, to use its potential. And our learning platform is called Atingi, which we rolled out via German Development Corporation and our partners, and uh, it already reached over 11 million people. And uh, I just wanted to stress that uh, next to norms, we focus on standards and skills. And with these three cornerstones, we try to contribute towards um, working on a digital transformation, which really contributes in the fight against um, environmental dam damages and challenges. And um, this is our concrete work next to the coordination efforts in the global arena and fora. Thank you so much. So much. I think that's co that commitment is very important in order to detect the impact you know, that the policy developments and norms will have when in place, as Becky was pointing out. Uh, it might be difficult then to revert you know, the effects of uh, what policies and norms enable um, or the result that they produce. So thank you for that. Jaime, uh, let me know if you want to intervene at this point. Uh, to refer to the questions that Paz brought up. Otherwise, I can open the floor for questions and comments here and also from remote participants. So, Jaime, first let me hear from you if you would like to intervene. Uh, sure, gracias, Valeria. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have anything new to add. I really, I agree with a lot of what has been said so far. I just, I really want to highlight some of the points that, that some of our uh, uh, other guests have, have made. The, um, I really agree with Kemley that we have to push back on, on, on this dominant model of, of, of thinking about how solutions are made, this dominant capitalist narrative that only excessive, excessively profitable high yield businesses can guide us through uh, uh, climate change. This kind of ridiculous thinking is, is what is driving the investment and the promotion of things like artificial intelligence. And we have to remember that artificial intelligence doesn't exist on its own. It is fueled by our data, our information. It is this, this rampant accumulation and extraction of, of, of our knowledge that makes this possible. And that is built on the, that has a, a, a very huge physical environmental impact and it has a and it has a real emotional impact psychological impact on on us as a as a society to operate that way this this kind of thinking this nonsense is essentially trying to put out a fire with gasoline uh, we can't allow this to continue and i really appreciate these comments about pushing back against the greenwashing of these businesses these companies who make enormous profits based on these extractive business models of surveilling their users and then spend just a tiny fraction of that money to create a few exemplary uh, sustainable data center projects. We can't applaud these things. These public relations stunts, they don't address the total environmental impact of all of the computing resources that are need to con to, needed to continue their operations. But also they, they, they are essentially, even if they do comply with their promises for reducing their carbon footprints, when they're essentially doing damage control to, to a problem that they themselves have created. Uh, and we, we can't allow this kind of thing to continue. I really agree with, with, with um, supporting a different, uh, different thinking, different model, supporting community and cooperative-based models uh, towards, towards supporting communications and, and listening to ourselves and taking guidance from, from our communities in, in, in these matters. And in that sense, 
we've been doing, a lot of us have been doing this for a long time. And if it, and if we are to be supported, I think it, it needs to be on our own terms. We need to be trusted to continue uh, practicing uh, community engagement in the way that we have been doing and organizing ourselves in the way that we have been doing. Precisely, that's part of the, perhaps one of the most important responses to enable that that community engagement and response is uh, is possible and feasible. So let me open for reactions, comments, questions from the floor and also from remote participants. If there is anyone here that could like to intervene and to uh, pose a question or a reaction, your interventions are welcome. Um, so let me know, you, you can raise your hand, we can pass you the mic, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Valeria. <laughs> I think, is the microphone working? Yes, okay, very good. I very much appreciate uh, this session. My name is Peter Brook. I'm the chairman of the World Summit Awards. And uh, what we do is uh, we focus on best practice examples exactly regarding uh, new and different business models. In this room, our next session, is on hacking digital divides, and you will see Alloy, for instance, which is a microfinancing solution for small and micro businesses. You will see Social Lab from uh, Chile, which uh, shows actually, uh, I think um, you will love this uh, very much, a business model based on love, and they have 600 different kind of uh, uh, companies there. Then we have uh, uh, people from uh, from Lebanon which show how social volunteers work and it's uh, something very interesting because um, the digital transformation centers work with us regarding promoting these examples we were just in Mexico in Puebla and, and doing this one of the key things however is uh, for this session which I think is really so important is to talk about the technology frameworks and the alternative of technology frameworks. And, um, and I think what Jaime was saying is, is really very much to the point, but it, he is giving, Jaime, you are giving us a critique, but you're not showing us what would be possible solutions. So for instance, one of the things which I think is very much important when you're looking at large language uh, models and uh, machine learning and how you train them, that very few people I have not seen any government talk about how to tax the AI companies for how they train their models with the data. So they are not paying for the data which they use to train. They are not respecting copyright in terms of when they train it. They are not giving anything back. So one of the things which I found, found very interesting when you talk about the social, ecological, and feminist policy in terms of cooperation, does the BMZ have actually a clear understanding that you need to go into a, the economics of how to make AI smarter, AI sm uh, and what would it be actually in terms of a cooperative model for that aspect, because then we are really addressing, Valeria, the issue of this session, which is alternative technology frameworks. We need to see, and I think Jaime is very clear on that, is that we have a very much a hidden extraction situation, exploitation situation, uh, but it is not being recognized as such, and therefore we are not even using market models, which makes which means making them pay for the smartness of their models. And uh, uh, we are not moving to this, although we have with the German government, you know, one of the key players in that industry, I mean, uh, global play, you know. So my question is very much to Ilmas on this issue. Have you thought about it yourself? Is there anything in terms of the policy development? And then Valeria, I would be very happy to engage more with APC in terms of finding good examples of where you are not creating a parallel economy, but where you are basically seeing, okay, how can we transform the economy and uh, do that in a different way? So that would be my little five cents. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution. Is there any other contribution from the floor or uh, pass? Um, let me know if there are remote participants who would like to intervene or present questions for the panel. No. No yet here, yeah. Okay, so um, obviously the panel is invited to react, to comment, to respond to what has been said. Uh, any one of you could like to take that on, please. Um, yeah, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, question. Um, let me first um, say one sentence to our further engagement in this regard and then get back to your answer. Um, the beam sets digital initiatives provide knowledge about regulation setting standards, I said, in order to promote our goals for fair digital transition in partner countries. And one initiative, which I didn't mention, but is really fitting in this context, is the BMZ initiative, Fair Forward, which contributes towards the development of open AI training data sets in Kishwahili and Luganda, inter alia, language is spoken by more than 150 million people collectively. Um, further, through the initiative Fair Forward, we have worked with governments, uh, Rwanda, Ghana, and India, I mentioned, and um, how they contribute for green tech solutions. We see open access to AI training in data and research, as well as, as open source AI models as a foundation for local innovation. On Tuesday in our session, um, our partners from the Mozilla Foundation are also here. Um, the economics of our engagement is super interesting. Um, the aspects that you uh, mentioned, and um, I, I'm a fan of that approach actually as a uh, studied economist, but I think as for now um, we have a different approach. And uh, I will get that question, uh, take that back to Berlin and uh, discuss with our colleagues which are operationalizing doing that program. And um, programs are also developing and, and, and changing, uh, I would say, generally. Um, but at the end, for me, it's important what the outcome and the impact of these programs are and how they can contribute towards local solutions and um, transforming the uh, local population and um, um, the economics of the local development is essential. Um, but I also think it's a global question um, which we need to discuss and, um, and, and taking it from there, um, I would like to, to engage with you uh, beyond this panel and uh, discussion and uh, let's discuss also uh, after the IGF please and, uh, and uh, maybe other colleagues on the panel have also contributed. Thank you. The cooperatives that have uh, that are present here, obviously, they have been also thinking and implementing different type of solutions and providing responses. So, if there are, uh, let me just check if there are other questions or comments here. Otherwise, yes, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Daichi Sakamoto, and the uh, Doba Corporation is a private company in Japan. So, very interesting discussion, and then so. I'm working on the here, so IT industry in Japan. And then in Japan, there is a word that uh, digital dokata. Digital dokata, dokata means the construction worker. So it's just a work, digital worker, but working like as the construction worker means, so very small work. And then, so accumulate Accumulation of the small workers, small work will be big, so make big building. This is the Japanese so industry culture. So, but if the AI coming here, and then maybe this mindset will be changed, but it, I think it will be moderate because so it's very big change. And then, so this kind of the, the layer, layer structure you know, it's the small worker will be used by the readers, and then readers, reader use, and then this kind of the pyramid structure is existing in the industry. So maybe if we we think about the 
this digital transformation, we need to take care each all of layers. So how to transformation, how to transform the each layers. So at that time, maybe the AI will be so violate or disrupt this the layers, and then maybe new style or new business model will come. So in in fact, so I heard several I offered several works of the new era or new business model. That means uh the new work is uh training AI. So training AI means so make a data of the conversation. It's very easy and maybe anyone anyone can speak Japanese can train the AI. So this is just a new style work, but there's also the big gap of the current work and the previous work. So maybe this kind of the gap of the new business model and the current model will be the problem in the industry. I, I've, I've heard that in this discussion. Thank you very much. I would like to finally invite the, 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 the panel and our remote uh, speakers as well to just share some final remarks uh, with some recommendations or demands that you might have to different stakeholders, including governments, of course, uh, uh, of if you want to dig a little bit more into the, the point that was brought up about solutions and responses. So um, you are welcome to do so. So I would like to start with Becky, if you uh, would like to share some final comments with the audience. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll keep my uh, final comment very short, which is to say that one, one important thing that is required in order to support the kinds of solutions that already exist uh, and pathways that already exist within a just transition um, and that includes examples brought forward today by panelists both remotely and in the room. So to support those, we also have to challenge <coughs> what the climate justice movement for decades has called out as false and misleading climate solutions. So that includes uh, pushing for policy that can address greenwashing and also pushing for strong regulation around speculative and dangerous climate technologies. Um, some of these technologies are not always part of the digitalization discussion, for example, solar geoengineering, carbon credits, but they are technologies that are being invested into heavily by big tech companies um, as part of plans to be able to continue the profit models that they rely on. So that's why it's important for the audience um, of the IGF to also begin to engage around these kinds of technologies as well and see them as part of the same discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. So let me go to Florencia. Florencia, you would like to share your final comments and demands or recommendations? Yes, thank you. Just to highlight again uh, the, the aspect about responsibilities in uh, related to each uh, holder. Uh, in our uh, focus, uh, e-waste is a very complex uh, problem and uh, the interrelation of holders and of actors is a, a challenge. Uh, and, and also um, maybe it, it, it would need to be involved. Um, the idea that is uh, it should be a public service to, to assume this, uh, this problem and also uh, the, the, the fact of the profitability of these of these actions. We we work it in a very uh, small experience, but it it's a huge problem uh, affecting really deeply um, environment. And also, it's a problem that it has a very uh, big potential in in work uh, generation. Uh, possibilities and opportunities for, for, for people and also for um, addressing the digital divide uh, also. So thank you. 
Thank you, Florencia. Let me go to Gilmas for, for your final comments, please. Um, thank you so much. Um, this was super interesting and an honor to be here. BMZ contributes to variable various political responses, processes and fora. Our key question is how can we reinforce efforts to bring uh, local perspectives and national perspective from the global south um, in the international arena? And we have a wide growing international network in working relations with a number of governments, but also especially civil society actors and other stakeholders, which we use in favor of more digital cooperation. On an international level, the German government especially supports the global digital compact, that w which was mentioned before. And uh, we also actively engage in discussions on in the G7, G20 context and multi-stakeholder initiatives such as GAFSTEC that I mentioned and the Digital for Development Hub of the European Union. Global digital cooperation is essential for us to support a holistic approach to the digital transformation but not also for its opportunities, but also for its risks. I personally think we must foster close cooperation on a large scale in order to advance social and a sustainable digital transition around the globe. This is why we are here. Let's stay in touch. Um, this was super helpful. Thank you so much for your perspectives. I think um, with sharing these formats, uh, we are stronger and um, can build a digital world where we can um, achieve our goals together. Uh, Jaime, uh, you have the floor, please. Thank you. I, I, I agree in, in that the, with uh, the gentleman who called out these large companies for what essentially is criminal behavior of using all of using our data to train uh, these language models uh, at no cost of their own. I, and while I, I agree that that we we need to hold. Uh, these the these companies and corporations accountable for these actions. Uh, the idea of allowing them to pay a fine, to pay a tax, I, I I have strong questions about this. How is this different than the system of carbon credits, and how is this different than 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 a shell game that allows them to 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 do wrong and pay for it later, right? With the with the enormous profits they're able to make from that, and 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 likewise. This idea that that how the, these questions, I think they're very interesting questions about how this changes the role of the worker and 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 what participation uh, we can have as workers in training AI models. But I, I think it's important to remember also that we there's there's choosing to be a worker, and then there are ways that we will be forced to be workers, and we will be forced to train AI. We will be forced just to have access to technology through tiny widgets that are presented to us, to puzzles that we have to solve, through any kind of information that we have to give to the AI. We will have no choice in, in, in training these models. And, and what do we do about that, where we are exploited and we are not even treated as real workers, and we are just uh, and we are essentially serfs within this, this wider system? Uh, I think that, of course, supporting local initiatives, of course, supporting uh, indigenous languages and their preservation is, is tremendously important. But I, I don't believe that we can apply a single model to all cases. And I think it's very important our, to ask ourselves, are we asking, are we listening to, to, to these communities directly? Is this what they want? And, and maybe there are cases where, where, where they are interested in, in, in experimenting and having access to these technologies. But I don't think we can apply this uh, as a single solution across the board to, to everywhere that this is the way that to, to stimulate local uh, local preservation of languages and, and indigenous cultures. I think we have to ask and give in, in, in everywhere there has to be a proper consultation with local communities whether this is something they are actually interested in. Absolutely. And the global community has a role to play in ensuring that those perspectives and the ones impacted by the in reality are brought to these conversations because as Jaime is pointing out, there is no a single solution that fits everyone. So hearing and, and from, from the ones that are impacted and the realities and the particularities is very important. And for that cooperation and also the, the commitment of all the stakeholders to make sure that those voices are heard because there is a voice. The problem is that they are not welcome or not heard in different spaces. So I think that's that's mm, very necessary and one of the, the, the needed actions 
actions in, in order to change the paradigm. So let me close the panel with Kemli. Kemli, your final remarks, and then to thanking you all for the presence and the comments and for joining the conversation about this key, key issue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Boop, for, for your intervention. That made me think a lot, yes. Uh, but I have uh, the same reaction than Jaime, yes. Then if you pay, you can do it, yes. And I would like to, to also uh, integrate the, and discuss with my colleagues with a feminist analysis what you are proposing. Yes, uh, yes um, especially because of that, because if we charge the machine learning, uh, the training machine la learning is not a way to accept that they can do that if they charge. Uh, and also because in the feminist analysis, technology frameworks has to be very related to solve the concrete problem in the context where we women live. Then technology framework for us, yes, have to be related with this context around us, the care of our children, the care of our community, then the, our technology framework, pri we prioritize these technology frameworks. Then this is one thing. The second thing about the job and the fair job and the precariousness, uh, precariousness of, of work, and how that is transforming, and how all what we win as workers are transforming, and we, uh, this is another discussion. And I think this business model, collective business model, cooperatives, and all of that have in the center a fair job, and especially a fair job for women. Then uh, it's totally connected. If we have fair jobs, we can survive as humanity in this world. If we have precarious jobs or work, we are not going to survive as humanity for sure. Then just to say thank you very much. I think this is a conversation to follow and go in depth and discover and explore. Thank you. Thank you very much again for your openness. And let's continue the conversation in the different spaces here at the IGL. So thank you very much. Thank you.